race to win wars and explore the stars have created some of the most fantastic products ever designed and we use them every day unaware of their amazing origins on wicked inventions the zippo lighter the surprising wartime heritage of this iconic piece of americana margarine we reveal the military connection to your yummy spread Cling film, wrapping up everything from fighter planes to food. We reveal the amazing science and manufacture behind these wicked inventions. The Zippo Lighter is an American invention that has become an icon of its nation. From the US military to Hollywood, the Zippo is now world famous and used in every corner of the globe. But did you know its origins can actually be traced back to Austria? And just how did this lighter become so synonymous with the US military? George G. Blaisdell founded the Zippo Corporation in the fall of 1932. He actually had made arrangements to import an Austrian-style lighter. It took so long to get things through customs at that time that he was still tinkering in, with his own idea. He wanted one-hand operation, he wanted the lighter windproof, and he wanted to guarantee the product for the life of the product. His first production month was January of 33. He manufactured 82 lighters that month, and almost 83 years later, we have manufactured over 500 million Zippo lighters. With its easy one-handed use, durability, and windproof characteristics, the Zippo soon became the lighter of choice for US military personnel. This military link grew even more during World War II, as Zippo ceased production of the lighters for consumer markets and began delivering only to the military. George Blaisdell formed a relationship with the famous war correspondent, Ernie Pyle. And he wrote to Ernie and said, I suppose you've never heard of the Zippo lighter. And Ernie wrote back and said, are you kidding? It's the most coveted item on the battlefield. This created a huge demand for Zippo lighters and can be seen as a defining moment in the company's history. When I was a young soldier, I must confess, I used to smoke. And one of the problems especially if you're out in the field, was simply lighting your cigarette. And I was very grateful when a, an American soldier, very good friends with him, gave me my first Zippo lighter. Back on the consumer market, the Zippo's reputation then grew to see it become the lighter to be seen with in Hollywood. Tom Hanks is a great Zippo collector. John Wayne, he would actually use only our lighters in his movies. Frank Sinatra also was a great fan of Zippo. He said, when I die, bury me with 10 dimes for the payphone, a bottle of Jack Daniels, a pack of Luckies, and my Zippo lighter. Having produced over half a billion lighters, Zippo has cemented itself as the most famous and most recognizable lighter in the world. And it sits comfortably in the pockets of soldiers, civilians, and celebrities alike. So, what goes into making these iconic lighters? Well, the Zippo lighter is obviously uh, made up of two key components, the inside unit and the, uh, the case. And uh, the inside unit is, uh, is, is a unit that's uh, produced with a lot of specialized equipment made specifically for Zippo. The manufacturing of the famous Zippo lighter begins with the cases. A thin sheet of brass is uncoiled from a spool and sent to a press. The strips of brass are stamped repeatedly until the top and bottom of the case is formed. Zippo recycle all of the excess brass so it can be reused and wastage is kept to a minimum. The stainless steel hinges are welded onto the case, joining the top and bottom. This is then inspected to make sure the weld and fit of the hinge is absolutely perfect. A robot lifts up racks of the new cases and places them on a line that in turn plunges them into a series of washing solutions to remove even the smallest amount of debris from the cases. 
They're then coated in nickel. Nickel acts as a glue for the chrome, as chrome doesn't adhere directly to brass. The cases can then be dipped into a chrome solution for four minutes, ready to emerge with their recognisable finish. They're then taken from the dipping racks, ready to meet the all-important inside unit. Once we get through plating, uh, we call it at that point uh, pocket ready because we will have the inside unit coming from the other part of the plant. As with the cases, the lighter insert, or inside unit, begins life as spores of sheet metal. This time it's steel. A die shapes the steel to form the lighter insert. 125 inserts are produced every minute, and around 2,400 pounds of steel go into producing 55,000 of these units a day. The inserts are then moved down the production line, and all the component parts are added. Within the inside unit, obviously, the, uh, the key components there are the, uh, the cam, which helps close the lid, snaps the lid uh, closed, and obviously we have the, uh, the wheel, and we've done a lot of work uh, with the wheel so that it does strike and it does light the first time. And again, a lot of specialized equipment that put a lot of these uh, little mini components, if you will, the wheel, the cam, the cam spring, the wick, the cotton, the felt, uh, all those little components, they get assembled. Once the inside units have been fully assembled and completed, the Zippo cases can be decorated in one of many different ways. Zippos can be painted, powder coated, printed, have emblems glued to them, and even engraved. The Zippo lighter appeals to people of many ages because of what we decorate the case with. We refer to the Zippo lighter as a miniature artist canvas. Now that the cases are freshly decorated, technicians then install the lighter insert into them, testing the fit and function in the process. Amongst other things, these technicians will test that the inside unit sits perfectly in the case, not too tight and not too loose. They check that the lid fits squarely and also that the Zippo gives its famous click sound when opening. It is then polished and boxed up in a display case, ready to be sent on to one of the millions of Zippo customers around the world. We take a 25 100 pound spool of brass, no more than 20, 20 to 30 thousandths of an inch thick, and take that through all of our processes and turn it into something that is a functional, usable, collectible product. So there's a, there's a huge transformation that we go through to get to this, to this little guy here. The Zippo Lighter, a fire starting, wicked invention. Margarine is accepted as the most affordable, spreadable, and long-lasting alternative to butter. But have you ever wondered about its origins in 19th century war and the controversy that once surrounded it? Being such a common staple of the modern fridge, it's as if it's been around forever. But just how did this spreadable breakfast companion come into existence? It all started in 1813 in a chemist's lab, as French scientist Michel Eugène Chevreau discovered a new fatty acid. Because of his substance's shiny, white and pearl-like appearance, he named it Acide Margarique, or Margaric Acid in English, after the Greek word Marguerite, meaning pearly. Despite this discovery, it wasn't quite the beginning of margarine as we know it today. This can be credited to 19th century French warfare. In 1812, Napoleon's French troops suffered terribly on their journey back from Moscow. This was down to two things, an ice-cold winter and food supplies perishing fast. In Napoleon's own words, an army marches on its stomach, and this one could not. Fifty years later, Napoleon I's successor, Napoleon III, wanted to ensure that his troops could be better supplied with longer-lasting foods. He was looking for a low-cost alternative, but kind of more nutritious alternative to butter, because the French army had always relied heavily on fresh bread and fresh butter, and he wanted something which could be taken away 
transported easily with a long shelf life which didn't damage and didn't rely on having the best shit herds of cows milling about to give the milk. It was around this time that the North German Confederation, led by the Kingdom of Prussia, were pushing to extend German unification, taking the French Empire with it. With the threat of war upon him from the Kingdom of Prussia and its Chancellor, Otto von Bismarck, the Emperor of France felt the time had come to solve the problem of perishing foods. He opened up a competition and a French food scientist, Hippolyte Merge Maury, came up with this alternative which was based largely on fat. So I think margarine is about 80% vegetable fats, which he then combined with different acids. Um, and the result he got was this kind of like creamy, pearly alternative to butter. In 1869, Hippolyte Merge Marie perfected a process that involved churning beef tallow with milk. He called his new spread Oleo Margarine, the name of which was later shortened to, you guessed it, Margarine. With this, Merge Marie won Napoleon's prize. The advantages over margarine to butter are probably the shelf life. It, it does have a longer shelf life, it doesn't spoil as easy, it can be produced cheaper, quicker, more efficiently. Well, it's vitally important that soldiers can carry their food long distance without it perishing. The uh, resupply systems can, can break down and the soldier needs to be able to survive on what he's got in his, in his equipment. In the early 20th century, with beef fats in short supply and advances in hydrogenation, Margarine began being manufactured with animal fats combined with other fat sources, such as vegetable oil. So, how was this achieved? Hydrogenation in margarine production is the forced chemical addition of hydrogen into vegetable oils. This process alters the material's melting point and transforms the oil's form from a liquid to a solid at room temperature. In layman's terms, this means a food producer can take a cheap and readily available ingredient, such as soybean vegetable oil, and create a spread that mimics butter, but is cheaper and has a far longer shelf life. As the commercial potential of this new, cheaper butter alternative began to be recognised, the white substance soon started to be coloured yellow in order to better resemble butter. However, dairy firms panicked and soon had the colouring of the margarine banned. This meant that by the turn of the century, margarine companies added sachets of dye in with their packaging, so the spread could be coloured at home. Margarine's huge increase in popularity came as a direct result of necessity caused by war. In World War II, natural butter was almost impossible to come by, and consumers everywhere turned to the much more widely available alternative. Once the war was over, demand for margarine stayed giving the producers greater power in the market, eventually resulting in margarine finally being coloured yellow again by 1955. Today, this versatile spread continues to be adapted and improved upon with companies seeking to increase its healthiness. Omega-3 and also cholesterol-reducing plant sterols are included in margarine's production in order to appeal to an ever-changing and growing market. From imperial French battlefields to the kitchens of the 21st century, it's safe to say that margarine is truly a wicked invention. Our intrepid tester is not happy. He has no butter left in the fridge and his bread is very dry and dull. But don't worry, he has all the necessary ingredients to make a magical margarine. The ingredients are fat sauce, olive oil, water, turmeric to colour the margarine a glorious golden yellow, a lemon to give our concoction a slightly zingy taste, a blender, and finally some lesser thin. More on that later. To start, our tester pours the oil into the blender. He then adds some of the water. Unfortunately, the water and oil won't mix very well, so this is where the lesser thin comes into play. Lesser thin is a fat that is essential in the cells of our body and can be found in many different substances, including soybean and eggs. It is often used as a food additive, as it helps substances mix together, which otherwise cannot, such as our oil and water, and this is called emulsification. So far, the mixture isn't going to set the tester's taste buds on fire, so he adds a good squirt of lemon juice to give it a tangy edge. The mixture is given a little stir, and any resemblance to butter seems very far off, so let's blitz it in the blender. 
as our margarine mix blends away, the lecithin gets to work and allows the water, oil and lemon juice to emulsify and thicken into something that is actually starting to resemble a margarine. As earlier margarine pioneers found to their cost, our margarine is also looking a little pale. So in goes the turmeric to add a bit of buttery colour to our mix. After a few more minutes blending, we actually have something that resembles margarine. While not quite as solid in form as high street margarine or butter, our mixture spreads nicely and, because of the lesser thin, has emulsified successfully to become a lot thicker than the olive oil it is made from. So, what about the taste? Mmm, that looks lovely. Uh, well, maybe not, but at least it beats dry bread. Possibly. Have you ever looked at an everyday product such as cling film and wondered about how it's made? We use cling film every day, but did you know we have World War II to thank for its development? It has been the kitchen essential for decades, but how did people conserve food before cling film? Before the 1950s, people typically wrapped food in the home in paper or even newspaper. Then cellophane was developed, which was quite crinkly and noisy. People used that for a while and then eventually cling film was developed. Cling film was invented during the 1940s, but did you know that it was originally discovered by accident and given the name Saran? Saran is actually a trademark of the Dow Chemical Company, who originally developed a type of cling film during the war period. They found a byproduct in one of their labs that was sticking very solidly to glass containers. There was a scientist called Ralph Wiley at Dow Chemicals who was looking to try and make sort of a hard substance to cover his car. And he accidentally came across this substance that was a green bit at the bottom of a, of a vial. And he didn't really know what to do with it because it wasn't coming off with anything. And started to work out that it was a very impermeable substance. It wouldn't let anything through it. And as a result, that was kind of the genesis of cling film, just trying to work out what is this green substance at the bottom of a vial. The substance we now know as cling film had a very different application when it was first discovered. It was put to a very good use by the US Army in the Second World War. During the war effort, it was used to spray army vehicles to protect them from the elements, from salt spray in shipment or bad weather. The military took Saran as a compound. They sprayed it on planes. It acts as a rust inhibitor. It coats everything. So if you have paint that water gets underneath it ordinarily, that has a chance to react with all the iron in it, and it will start to rust and then the paint bubbles, and then actually that causes structural problems. In World War II, that's quite a varying set of conditions from sort of Borneo to Germany and Japan, and that's really why it's necessary, is to stop it from everything from degrading. It's this protection from degradation that have since allowed cling film to be used in a variety of applications today. Cling film has found its way into some strange applications. It's also used in spas and hotels to wrap salt scrubs and mud scrubs. We see it in hairdressing, where people colouring their hair use it to protect the products on their hair during the colouring process. And finally, it's also had a medical purpose in that it's used to wrap burns as it doesn't stick to skin. But it's in the kitchen where it really comes into its own. Cling film forms an airtight barrier around food, therefore preventing air and bacteria getting into it. This slows decomposition and keeps it fresher for longer. A kitchen really needs cling film. It's so easy just to pull the wrap over, completely seal it. It usually fits to any dimensions. It stretches, it's pliable, it's bendy, it's airtight, it's easy to store. The chemicals contained within the cling film do not react with the food, so it doesn't change the flavour. It's perfect for food storage, really. So there we are, from a mysterious substance in the bottom of vial to food storage, health and beauty, and even medical uses. Cling film really is a wicked invention. Limpack have been making packaging for the food industry since 1949. It originally produced carton board for farmers and growers in the area to transport their goods to market. But in 1960, Limpack packaging was developed as a new company to produce rigid and plastic packaging for the global food industry market. 
the company have manufacturing plants all around the world, including this one in Pontivy, France. Limpat Pontivy was established in 1980 and today manufactures a range of barrier and PVC cling films from the site where we have over 400 people employed. The raw materials that make cling film are delivered to the factory and stored in large silos, bags and intermediate silos inside the factory. The ingredients follow a strict recipe and are first of all mixed together in the correct quantities. The extrusion process moves the dry blend through a barrel under high pressure, temperature and friction. This slowly melts the material into a viscous form. The molten mixture is then extruded in a machine called a die head. The die head is circular in shape and air is pushed through the die head to then create a bubble. This bubble of film is carried up on rollers and then slit in order that the film can be wound onto cores and taken away from the production process. The thickness of the film is determined by the amount of air pressure inside the tube, as well as by the speed at which it is pulled by the rollers. Today, cling film is produced at about seven microns, which is 10 times thinner than a human hair. The film is then wound onto large rolls. Just before exiting the winder, the roll is cut into smaller widths, as required by the customer, and then wound onto individual cardboard cores. The rolls are then loaded onto a pallet and sent to the offloading zone, where the rolls can be processed further. The company use automatically guided forklifts to move the product around the factory. This is just one of the many labour-saving devices the factory uses. In the offloading zone, robots take the rolls of cling film one by one and load them onto a conveyor belt. The edges of each roll are cut by a machine to ensure easy unwinding for the customer. All offcuts are put back into the production process, resulting in wastage of only half a percent from this factory. For catering wrap, the larger rolls are unwound and rewound onto smaller rolls of lengths between 100 and 500 metres. The rolls are then packed into cutter boxes before being packaged up and sent out for delivery. The next step in the general evolution of cling films is really to make them biodegradable. They've pretty much gone as lightweight and thin as possible whilst retaining all the mechanical properties that are needed for keeping food wrapped and fresh. But developing a biodegradable version is the next step in the innovation plan. So there you have it. Originally developed for protecting military vehicles through to multiple applications today, from food to hairdressing to medicine. Cling film truly is a wicked invention. So there you have it, a dash through the hidden history, super science and amazing manufacture of products that you use every day, but have never realised their amazing background. The Zippo lighter, margarine and cling film, all wicked inventions. <laughs> <laughs>